Good morning. So nice to see you all. I mean, I, I always say good morning because that's what it is for me. So you may be on the other side of the world, in which case it may be nearly bedtime. But anyway, hello. <laughs> I'm Susan Smith. This is Stitched by Susan, my studio, and I'm quilting today on my long arm Lucy, who's kind of out of camera. There we go. So welcome. Um, Today we are going to be working on an edge to edge project. It is a baby quilt, so it won't be terribly long. And it's a quilt that has no particular challenges. Can you believe it? However, it's very um, pastel in color, so it will be pretty easy to see the quilting. But I thought I would spend a little bit of time talking about my loading process um, and maybe less time on the quilting. So this episode is all about um, you just kind of looking over my shoulder and watching through this edge to edge freehand quilting process as I do it on a quilt. So it is in real time. This is not pre-recorded. It's live. So occasionally we have oopses. So forgive us if that happens. But I want you to be able to just see the process as it happens in my studio. So. I'm on this side of the machine. My husband, Dave, whom I always call Mr. Producer, is on the other side of the cameras, monitors, etc., cetera, um, keeping all the, all the things going smoothly. So I will mention he does have to sneak away to his real job meeting a little later on. So at some point, we'll just be putting on the overhead view and the close-up view, and I'll just be quilting for a while. So don't hesitate to keep chiming in with your comments and so forth. We will certainly get to them um, at the end. So he'll just be gone for, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes, something in there. And I won't even tell you when, and you might not even notice. <laughs> Another thanks is due as well to our good friend, Dan, whose music you hear during the introduction and sometimes during the quilting. He's a fabulous guitar player. So thanks, Dan, for that. What else? Okay, we're on YouTube. I would love if you would like and subscribe to the channel. If you hit the little bell after you've subscribed, then you will get notifications whenever I'm going live. And these sessions, typically, I don't know that I've ever missed one since I started, but currently we run the first and third Friday of each month. So twice a month, um, same time, 9 a.m. in the morning Pacific time. And the projects vary. You know, today's a baby quilt and it's short. Sometimes it's bigger. Sometimes it's a quilt that does have challenges. Whatever the day's project is, I just kind of talk my way through as I'm quilting. So it's not a class per se, but you'll just get the tips that I'm using as I make decisions and as I quilt. So that's kind of what that looks like. What else? Um, just looking at my little list here of things to remember. Um, yes, podcast. And I've mentioned this before. I know I have, but I do have a podcast called Measure Twice, Cut Once and Other Life Lessons Learned from Quilters. So this this week on Wednesday, the new episode that went out was with a lady named Laura, who's from the East Coast, and she makes wood quilts. And they're all made from um, salvaged wood from various environmental disasters, fire, hurricane, flood, you name it. And they're really unique and special. She's actually got an exhibit right now in the New England Museum. So that's a good listen. If you're looking for something to listen to while you're quilting, get your noise canceling headphones on and plug into that podcast. So you can find all the episodes at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. And from there, you can just choose your favorite listening app. Okay, let's say hello to some people chiming in. How's that? Marie. Hi, Marie. I like your little waving hand. That's great. And Hilda, welcome. Paula Barnett, fantastic. And Barbara, good morning in Minnesota. Still morning in Minnesota. Good morning. Excellent. Arlene, good morning. Arlene's practically a neighbor. Sue, I'm seeing some regulars here. Good. Wow. Small crowd this morning. So if more chime in, I'll, I'll do more hellos. And if you're just lurking, introduce yourself. I'd love to meet you and know who's watching. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to get my sip of coffee in before we get going. You know, I always do. Here's my trusty cup of coffee. Mm. So if you are interested in supporting these episodes, they are free, of course, but you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And there you can either make a one-time contribution or there's a couple of membership options. There might only be one membership option right now. There you go. And a couple freebies that come to you if you choose that. So it's just a way to help us. We're always trying to upgrade our cameras, our sound equipment. And through that little program, we have indeed purchased the camera that does the close-up work. And you'll see as I quilt, it's super nice and clear. So thank you to some of you who are watching who have been supporters and have helped us to be able to do that. So we appreciate it. 
one last sip and we'll get quilting. All right, today we're working on a baby quilt. So it's not very large and I'm going to start loading. Now I use the red snapper system for loading, which means that I've got a little uh, rail. I can't think of the right word for it. Anyway, that's inside my leader here. It's a little rod. That's a good word for it. And so I'm just laying my, the edge of my quilt against that rod and then I have a um, partner one that snaps over the top of it. And it looks like this. And this is the fastest way I know of to load. And you'll see in a minute why, but I have not had to do any measuring, any centering. Um, that's why I prefer this system. It is so very speedy. So I'm just snapping it into place. And I have chosen to load my quilt sideways today for a couple of reasons. One is I always prefer when I can to have a selvage edge on the front and back. Um, it's easier to keep it smooth and flat and not have any distortion or stretching going on. Um, that's not essential and you can't always do it. But since I could today, I did. I think I could use a shorter rod there. And also my quilt will end up being loaded long wise this way. Um, that is also my preference if that works simply because there are fewer passes then because it's a narrower space this way. Make sense? It doesn't always work that way. There's different reasons for loading quilts different ways, but when I can, I load the backing selvage this way. If there was a seam, I would load it horizontally and my quilt is horizontal. That's my first choice. All right, now that we've got the front loaded, all I'm going to do is scoop up that backing, which is not very big because it's a baby quilt, and toss it over the front rail. So I'm just pulling this over the rail. You're probably getting a nice view of the back of my head as smoothly as I can. So can you see now looking at it how there's these kind of grooves in the fabric pulling off to this side? That's how I know it's not straight and that's what I need to adjust. So this is the part that enables you to not have to mark center on your backing, your top and all of that is the fact that you get the fabric laid out straight and then I can come around to my roller and simply start rolling it on. And I'm watching on bigger quilts. Sometimes you will see creases forming or a little, you know, shifting as it rolls and you might have to adjust it. So I'm always watching for that. But on this one, it's nice and smooth. So I'm just going to advance my roller till my rod on this side is within reach on this side of the quilt. And then I'll snap my leaders on there. My grips. I'm not always sure what to uh, word to use, you know? So squeeze them on and then it's just a matter of rolling it up. And just like that, we have a quilt backing loaded. And as you can see, it's nice and smooth. And I was going to show you another tip. This quilt is pretty nice and smooth, but sometimes quilts will come in and they've been folded for a while or even they've hung folded over a hanger in my waiting line. And I keep a spray bottle. It's just water. And just misting that back. And I would usually do it while it's, you know, before I've even rolled it on. While I've flopped it over, then I would mist the whole thing. And it just causes any creases that are in it to relax. And that way you don't have to press the backing, which is a real time saver too. But today's backing is nice and smooth. So there we go. I'm just going to grab the batting. Okay, I'm just making sure I get it loaded correctly because there's this time the customer provided the batting and it's just not got very much extra. So this is a warm and natural batting in bleached white and I think it might even be it might even be a bamboo because she's very 
she loves to do specialty things for her baby quilts. And here's the sweet little quilt. Isn't that pretty? It's just soft, soft pinks. So again, there is no particular need to center. You know, I don't have a center marking on my backing or on my front. I'm just visually kind of centering it so I have a nice um, space on either side that I can clip to with my stretchers. And I'm just visually getting it lined up on there straight. I'm gonna turn this one more notch. I'm often asked how tight I make my quilt tops. And for me, this is kind of my uh, non-technical measuring stick. I put my hand underneath, my fingers straight up, and I should be able to grab my fingers there. So it's, it is not taut like a drum. It's just tight enough that it's, it's not sagging. There's just enough tension to keep it smooth. And the same will hold true when I put my side clamps on. So just enough to keep everything smooth. And we're ready to start quilting. So this first step will be basting the perimeter edge. And I'm quilting, by the way, with Isocord 100% poly thread in a very, very pale pink. And I just see a little piece of lint in there, so I'm going to get that out from in my hopper foot. That's apt to be greasy lint, which is never a good thing. So let me just get that cleaned out. I mentioned this is live, right? These are the things I do live <laughs> on the fly. So I'm just locking in a few stitches. And then my machine does handily have channel locks. So now I've got my vertical line locked into place. My machine can't move left or right. So I'm able to make a beautiful straight line up the side of the quilt. If I did not have that channel lock, I might consider using a ruler or yardstick to get it straight and pinning it in place. But since I do have that channel lock, I just start stitching and basically adjust the fabric to line up with where my needle's going. Does that make sense? Because I know my machine is stitching a straight line. And I'll take the vertical off now and put the horizontal on. And I'm just making sure that my stitching falls within the quarter inch seam allowance at the edge. I'm probably at about 3 16 That way, when the binding is applied, this will not have to be undone. It will just be right out of sight underneath that binding. Just adjusting the fabric a little bit. And when I have a quilt that's nice and square vis visually, like this one is, and flat, um, and I'm using my channel locks, I have not bothered to put my long tape measure on that you see on some quilts. That's more essential when I know I've got to make adjustments to the quilt to keep it square. That's my guideline, but I don't think I need it for this quilt. And also this one is so very small. It's pretty easy to visually square it up. And you certainly could do a longer basting stitch. Um, I don't bother because it's just one more step to change the stitch size, but you certainly could. All right, so we've got the basting in place. We're gonna put a stretcher on each side. Once again, my side clamps are made by Red Snapper. It's part of their system. I just think I'm not partial to a particular brand. I just like to have long ones. That's the important thing to me, that they're long and fill up as much of this throat space as possible to get a nice even pull on my fabric. My machine came with, you're seeing the clamp here, it came with two clamps like this on each side. And of course that can tend to pull, you know, a little bit of a scallop. So I added these, um, side clamps, and there are other brands that work similarly that have a long um, gripping area. What I also like about these, can we see it on camera over here? When they're closed, they have a very slim profile, and I like that too. So those to me are the important factors in a clamping system. They're also very hard to get open when there's not a piece of fabric in there, just saying. There we go. All right, 
other clamp is in place. And just so you all know, the resident studio cat is sleeping underneath the long arm. Just making sure I keep everything just right. All right, and then the last thing I'm adding is magnetic bars on the front of my rails because my rails are metallic. It's an easy way to grip the quilt, um, preventing any sort of migrating of the quilt as I'm quilting this area, right? The sides are stitched. If I just quilted all over with, with nothing to hold it on the front, um, it might migrate up. So some people will choose to actually roll their top onto another roller because that serves the same purpose. It keeps it straight and it can't shift. I prefer to just float my batting and my f and my top are just floating down in front of me, but I do need to secure my working area. So that's what the magnetic bars do for me. We can put a shorter one on there. Hang on a second. Hmm, where's my short one? There it is. All right. So now what I've got is a working surface that's secured on all four sides and I'm ready to start quilting. And I think I'm going to pull it just a couple inches toward me. I'm really working at arm's length. As far as my magnets will let me go. There we are. Okay, are we able to see all right, Dave? Mm -hmm. Mr. Producer, sir? So I'm going to quilt a very simple, very um, whimsical, I guess, very unstructured rose all over this quilt. And that was... My thought process was there's a printed fabric in here, which you'll see as I quilt over it, that has these very soft, very unformed sort of roses. And just the delicate quality of the pinks. I just thought really soft, no sharp edges, that kind of quilting. Okay, hang on a second, people. We've got a funny squeak going on. What in the world? Okay, bear with me a sec, Dave. We'll put some pretty music on while I walk around to the back side and see if I can figure out what's going on. I'm not feeling any obstruction in my quilting. So I'm just around at the back of my rails trying to look at it from every angle to see what is sticking. And I think while it's in place, I can swivel the wheels. Just make sure there's no... I don't know what. I do not see any obstructions and I don't feel any on the wheels. So I just wonder if one of my, one of the belts on my rails, um, I don't know why it would squeak. Well, people, this is live quilting. Let's see what happens. I would feel it if there was any obstructions to the wheels. Interesting. Okay, well, folks, we're going to take it a step at a time. We've narrowed it down. It's actually happening in the motor area, which is not a good sign. So I'll keep going along and we shall see what we see. Mr. Producer is over there with his ear to the ground, seeing if he can narrow it down too. I mean, it sounds literally like something squeaky that needs oil, but I oil my machine incredibly thoroughly, so I don't think that's what it is, but. see how very casual this quilting design is. 
And basically what I'm trying to achieve is when the quilt is all done and in use and it's been washed and cuddled a few times, I want it to have some even texture. So I'm trying to keep my spacing fairly consistent. And what I mean by that is my rose petals, for example, are, oh, they vary, but from half an inch, maybe at the widest places to an inch apart. So my leaves also are about an inch wide and I will try not to leave any gaps then that are bigger than that. So when I'm trying to decide where to tuck in another flower or another leaf, that's kind of my guideline. Don't have anything bigger than an inch. And then when it's washed and scrunchled, it will all have a very similar texture across the surface. happy with this choice of thread color. It is so delicately pink that it doesn't just strike you as pink stitching across the white areas, but it kind of blends together. It's a little lighter than the pink fabrics and a little pinker on the white fabric, and that's a perfect middle ground as far as I'm concerned. So feel free to be typing any comments or questions as I quilt. And after I'm done one pass, we'll stop and have a look at them and see if there's any that I can answer for you. right there I think you can probably see I tucked in a little tiny leaf and I paused just a second before it because I was making this mental decision is that too big of a gap to leave unquilted and I decided that yes it was so I tucked just a small leaf in there so that's how my thought process works on that particularly when I'm trying to achieve as I said this kind of evenness of density of quilting. I'm going to tuck in another little tip for you while I'm close to the front. Um, maybe the overhead camera, Dave, so they could see, please. 
When I'm quilting a design like this that has a fairly big element, I'm, I'm always having to make decisions about how many more can I fit in before I bump up against that front rail. And if you're not super familiar with how far you can go, then before you start quilting, you can run your machine up to the front edge and make yourself a little barrier with painter's tape. That's how far I can quilt, because there's nothing worse than doing this lovely whimsical rose and chonk, it's got a square corner because you hit that front rail, right? So one more use for handy painter's tape. And can you see I'm kind of working my way up to the top of the quilt because I saw that I left this area up here unquilted. And I like to try and get the furthest away areas quilted first just so I can see visibly what's left, right? So I just echoed my way around that last rose till I got back up to this area to get it filled. I do not want to paint myself into the front. I mean, it would not be the end of the world. You can certainly travel up the side, but that's part of the challenge to me of doing this freehand is thinking ahead, knowing where I'm going, what I've got left to cover. And it's just really good practice to be kind of conscious spatially of where you are in the quilt and what's left to cover. Oh. I don't know if you saw, there was a little wobble on that rose petal, a little tiny overlap of a couple stitches. You know what? In the scheme of things, it'll be okay. And I'm just moving on. So that's pass number one. I will take off all my apparatus and Dave will let me know if there are any questions or comments that have come in. Joan, thank you so much, Dave, for your behind the scenes work that makes these videos possible. They're extremely helpful. Well, that was nice to know. Paula, do you have a general ratio of flowers to leaves or is it more about the space you have to fill that makes your decision? Much more about the space I have to fill, Paula. I try not to have, I try not to have too many leaves coming at each other from a, different directions and filling up an area with leaves, but it's much more about filling in the awkward corners. That's what the leaves are handy for, for sure. So I didn't get as far quilted on this side as I would have liked, so my advance is going to be small. That's just because I didn't think I could fit a whole other rose in there. And you know, just illustrating for you guys, there's no right and wrong way to do that. There's just the way I happen to be doing it today. So when I advance my quilt, I do a couple of things. You might have been able to see, I'm kind of grasping the batting too and pinching and pulling it because it's my experience that if I don't tug on my floating batting a little bit, it too tends to migrate even underneath the quilt. So either do that little tug of both of them or flip your quilt back at this point and just make sure. You can see here, there's, there was a bit of rumpling going on. I don't want any of that you know, underneath my quilt top happening unawares. So if you're not, you know, comfortable with the feel of it, then flip it back and have a look. Flip your quilt back forward and use your visual guidelines. So I'm just visually making sure these are vertical. And then when I start stitching, of course, I'll have my channel lock on too. And then visually also, I'm looking at my seam lines here because there is a nice seam line. You know, is that straight along my rail? And so if my quilt you know, was a little longer on one side, this would be my opportunity to be adjusting that. But this quilt is nice and square, so it's just not a big deal. So I'm gonna put my vertical channel lock on again. And just go ahead and stitch down this side. So that channel lock will let me know exactly if I need to adjust my quilt slightly from side to side. 
and it's looking good. And this would be a great opportunity when you're basting to take note of how far forward you can quilt. So I know I can only come that far forward, so I make a mental, you know, sort of note of where that is, or I put my painter's tape on there so that I don't inadvertently quilt further forward than that. So now I'm going to do the same thing on the right hand side. And I've just overlapped my last basting stitch by a little bit. This basting, as I said, completely um, disappears inside the binding, so it's not going to show. It does not have to be a thing of beauty. And there we are at the front. Now, this quilt does have one extra little feature, which it's fun to point out today. Let me just put my side clamps on first before I point it out. Maybe you've seen it already. It's the elephant in the room. Hint, hint. I'll just put my magnets on while I'm walking across the front. This little quilt today is so small and square, it's just easy peasy. This is enjoyable quilting. Alrighty, let's move so you can see it. In the center of the quilt is this little elephant with some balloons. And he is made of felt, or she, I guess, because she's pink. Um, it's felted and it's quite, um, I can feel that there's some type of bonding agent behind it. It's quite stiff too. So not going to be super easy to quilt through. So what I'm going to do is actually quilt around the elephant and the little balloons and maybe around the saddle on the elephant's back because this is a pretty big area to leave unquilted. So I suppose you could call this quilt light custom, maybe. But anyway, it's just a kind of little feature and I don't want to quilt straight across it because the elephant will look funny if I do that. So, but I'm just going to keep on with my edge to edge design and I actually have to roll my quilt back about an inch. I went just a hair too far. Um, I'm just going to keep on with my edge to edge design and when I get to the elephant I'll just bump right up against it and continue around it outlining it and then keep on going with my edge to edge. This time I'm going to take care to fill up this side fully. But in fact, we have such a tiny quilt, the next advance will be a small one anyways. And in fact, it will be the last one. It's not going to take very long at all. At least a few of you who are here um, were in my freehand quilting demystified group last week. And some of you have in fact signed up for my freehand quilting masterclass. So you've heard lots of my comments about why I love freehand quilting, but I think you're seeing a really good example today of one of the reasons. It is so incredibly quick to use my unfussy loading method and just in a matter of minutes, have a quilt loaded up on the machine, have my thread you know, loaded and start quilting. And it is not taking very long to turn out this baby quilt. So certainly one could be doing a digital pattern but honestly, I think it would take you longer to set it up than it would save you in time. But that's just my opinion, and I admit 
I admit freely that I am biased toward freehand work. I actually do have a kind of entry level computerized system on my machine and I hardly ever use it. I absolutely know that there are advantages to it, but it is also another skill set which I don't currently have. And so that takes time too, just to learn the skill set. So I prefer to just invest my time and creative energy into thinking up new freehand designs. And since you're here, I trust that there's other people like me out there. You can see I'm getting quite close to the elephant in the middle. So I kind of made, way, made my way back to this area that's still unquilted to get it filled in. Because once I've um, quilted around the elephant, then I want to be able to launch out the other side. So I'm kind of thinking of that as I go. And there is absolutely no shame in pausing at a corner like this and saying, now, what do I have to cover? Where should I go next? And kind of plot, I'm going to do this and then this and then this. Absolutely. I'm just trying to get this area kind of below the elephant closest to me filled in. And here I am against him. So I'm just going to freehand it. If you wanted to, you could certainly do this with a small ruler in your hand. I'm just taking care that I do not go on the flannel. If need be, I'm a thread or two away from it, but I do not want to stitch on the flannel. I think that would really catch your eye and would not be a pretty thing. And I'm just gonna make a couple wobbly lines in here that would be like the rose to fill in that little corner. Does that make sense? I don't want to leave, remember, a space bigger than about an inch unquilted anywhere because that will really puff up and catch the eye. So we're just snipping around the little elephant. And here too, I need to get a little more rose in there. There it is. Now I'm just going to echo on my stitching that I already put in place till I get round to the other side. And we're off. And that was the little elephant story right there. That's it. There is no more elephant in the room, unquilted. And you saw me pause there. I was just taking stock of the space that was left and deciding, do I put a rose there? Do I put a leaf there? And there's no wrong decision. that's important is that you get basically even coverage. Everything else will quite literally come out in the wash. After Paula's question, I'm realizing that I do tend to put my leaves in groups of two. And I don't know why, I've just kind of fallen into that habit. But it is certainly not essential. I think I feel like one by itself maybe doesn't show up very much. But again, my first consideration is always, do I have an awkward corner I need to fill? Put a leaf in it. And the beauty of these super casual leaves too is that I can bend them in absolutely any direction too, to fill any funky little corners.
and I'm going to go ahead and advance. I could probably fit a small rose in there, but I know that I don't have many more inches below, so I'm just going to go ahead and advance my quilt to the end, and then I can put a full-sized rose in there. Yeah, let's have some questions, and I shall get a sip of coffee. Let me just advance Lucy for a moment so that I can see where I'm at here. By the way, my long arm is named Lucy. And yes, indeed, I love her. What something is pulling, what is the scoop? This is always the thing when we're uh, filming is we get, we get cords and wires. So bear with us a sec. It's actually my fault. I left the clamp on the left, which you guys watching probably knew that and you're probably laughing at me. But you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to quilt and talk and make sense. I think that will be far enough. Okay, we have some questions and I have some coffee. Yay. Oh, Lucy's in the way. We're gonna change we're gonna change cameras. No, I'm not, she's attached. Okay, changing cameras and I'm getting my Hmm, that's not working well. Okay, hang on a second, folks. <laughs> this is part of the perils. Easiest thing in the world to detach Lucy for a sec. Take take a well needed break, Lucy. Go for it. Okay. So funny, funny little story to insert here. Of course, I'm walking back and forth across the front of this rail, right? And my shirt is getting more and more staticky <laughs> as the day progresses. Pretty funny. Lauren, can you show exactly how you just cut your threads? You bet, I'll do that for you. Judy, how often do you change your needle? Oh, when it breaks? No, that's not quite true, but it is close. Um, I'm kind of the queen of frugal, so I just buy very ordinary, uh, is it the Gross Beckert, I think is the brand online that I can buy in the sort of jumbo case. So I'm not shy about changing them when I need to, but I don't change with every quilt necessarily. I will change after I do a quilt that is batik because that's just such a tough fabric and it dulls the needle. And if I hear my needle, like I'm so familiar to what it should sound like, if I hear it kind of pop, pop, popping, as it goes through fabric, then it's definitely dull, out it goes, and I put a fresh one on. In reality, especially with baby quilts, I probably do half a dozen or eight before I change. If I was doing a queen or a king size quilt, I might change my needle after one, pretty much for sure after two. So that gives you a ballpark. Um, I know other quilters that use titanium needles and say they really don't ever change them except when they break. You know, that's an option. I have not tried that for myself. There's a long answer to a short question. Barbara, today's takeaway. There's no shame in pausing to assess and plan. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I, I've said this a, a bajillion times, but I'm approaching a thousand quilts and all but about 15 of them have been done freehand like this, right? So my brain is just so used to looking ahead, planning, da 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 da. But if you're newer to freehand, I did this too, and I still do it sometimes. Absolutely, take a corner of your quilting and just pause there for a sec and, and plan your process. One last sip. I would love if you're enjoying this, if you would like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'd also love if you would share these videos with friends. And in fact, um, you know, again, some of you, quite a few of you saw my presentations over the last couple of weeks, my little live episodes. I am more than willing to do those for guilds or groups of women, like you don't have to be a formal guild, but if there's a half a dozen of you that would like to do, you know, a private session, you've got some particular topic in mind, I absolutely love teaching. I certainly love talking, I don't know if you've figured that out yet, but. So, reach out if you want to do something like that. You can always find me info at stitchedbysusan.com. So I've got my little horizontal channel lock on and I'm really close to the edge. So I'm just adjusting it a tiny bit. Either way, it's gonna fall within the binding, but it just makes it a little easier on me if I've got more than two threads worth to work with. You can see how beautifully flat this quilt is. I'm not having to make hardly any adjustments at all or pull in any fullness. This quilt sewer did just a beautiful job. She's a great client. 
And she's not even online today, so she doesn't even know I'm bragging her up. And there we go. We've met up with our uh, earlier basting. I'm just going to hover over an area so you can see it. Do you see right here, there's a little bit of fullness. And because I had my channel lock on, I, I did shift the quilt up a little bit so that I was catching a consistent seam allowance on the edge. So I'm just gonna kind of push that into my quilt. It's not very much, but just so it's kind of evenly spread out and that will all disappear into the quilting. getting my little grips on the side. They have such a very narrow little channel that the fabric has to go into. And if, you're, if the edge of your fabric is not cut perfectly straight, it kind of is difficult. So bear with me while I get that in my gripper. And uh, let me see if I can get where you can see me. This is just my trusty yardstick that I put uh, can, we can't see it on either end. There we go. You still can't see it. Um, it's just under the strap that's holding my gripper just to raise it up a little bit. Um, this just tends to sag a little and I bump into it when I come toward the edge. So my trusty yardstick, curtain rod works, anything that's just kind of stiff and long enough to go from rail to rail can be really helpful there. Now, mental note here, I do usually alternate which side I'm quilting from. So I end it on the left, so I'm gonna begin this one on the left, this pass. So I'm gonna pause stitching for just a sec, ladies. Um, Mr. Producer has to, has to tootle off to his meeting, but of course when he's gone, I can't both uh, man the comments. I'm right behind the camera. I know I can't both man the comments and um, The camera Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say So anyway, if you have any questions fire them up right now Because probably what will happen then is I'll keep talking and I'll continue the process But when I'm done, I'm just gonna say goodbye and then <laughs> and then close the session So it's a little different today You are certainly welcome to still type questions in and I'll come back and type in answers but I just cannot be on both sides of the camera. I don't know why that is, but it is so. So are there any more questions or comments, Dave, that I should take? There aren't any, okay. This is a pretty simple process, so I'm just gonna go ahead and finish the quilt, talk a little bit while I'm doing it, and then I'll, I'll say goodbye. So I hope this has been kind of helpful and fun. And y you know over the last couple weeks of, of lives, I've been talking quite a lot about using baby quilts as your testing ground for things you're not sure of. So they're a great size to try out new patterns, to maybe even test your color th theory. Some of my social media posts lately, I've talked about um, choosing colors because when you're doing edge to edge work, sometimes you're quilting across multiple fabrics and colors. And like, how do you think that through and what looks pleasing? And sometimes you can tell by looking and sometimes you've just got to try. So a baby quilt is a really good, unthreatening way to try. Because you can't go too far wrong. And also the recipients just love them no matter what. And I'm not sure that you can see on camera, but on a number of these leaves, I want to be going out sort of the other side of them and I end up crossing over my stitching. I personally see no problem with that. My texture remains constant. It's one of those things that comes out in the wash and I think looks totally fine. There are some designs where it would really show if you cross over your stitching. This is not one of them. So again, a really forgiving design to quilt for that reason too.
like right there. I just crossed right over the earlier line of stitching. And that will not be visible really at all when the quilt is finished. Here I'm just echoing around my big rows to get back to an area that I know I've still got a quilt up here. One more beauty of this design. Even after you've finished a rose and done another one and another leaf, you can still go back and add in an echo just for the purposes of traveling. The weird squeaking has stopped. I still have really no idea what that was. But I shall investigate further. I've kind of broken my rule now of quilting the areas that are furthest away from me first. I just quite like to focus on making a nice edge on the quilt. Certainly not critical. You can just run your quilting right off and it doesn't matter at all. But I just kind of get a kick out of thinking of that and making it pretty as I'm going. So I'm kind of doing the edge and then filling in.
when I'm down in that area anyways. So I'm gonna make my way down to that edge again. Let's see, we did a rose on the edge, so now I'll do a leaf on the edge. And then another rose. And now I'll fill back up the areas that I've left in the center unquilted. Little leaf in there, a little rosebud in here. And I will be sure to post some photographs of this quilt as a whole so you can get a better big picture view um, on my social media accounts. Usually my best light for photographing is in the morning. Of course right now we're having a series of very gray days so as soon as I can get some decent light and get photographs that show up the quilting I will do that for you. Right into a rose. And now I'm quilting right off the edge. See that? There was just no other way. So that rose looks a little chopped off. And that's all right. There still are no um, thread ends, right? It's all very secure. So even when I trim this quilt ready to be bound, there's no bits that are going to come undone. I just pretended like my rose extended right off the edge. more big rows and a couple of leaves and that'll do it. Secure the thread. We're done. All right. So that is the whimsical rose applied to a baby quilt with a little tiny elephant in the center for visual interest. So yes, if you have any questions, feel free to keep chat typing them into the chat window and I will come back to them and type answers to you. But lots of you know where to find me too in my Facebook group, which is also called Stitched by Susan. I'm quite active in there. So that's a great place too to ask questions, especially if you want to leave a photograph of your quilt and ask a question about it specifically. So with that, I think we're done with today's lesson. Thanks so much for joining me and we will be back the third Friday of November. So see you then. Ta-ta.